All right, thank you. Um, so I've only talked once and I'm already a full lecture behind. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to change the kind of program. Um, so today will just be, I think, pretty much a continuation, a finishing up of Lejeune and contact homology, I hope, the definitions. And then um, uh, the next two lectures I'll have to kind of compactify um, not contact homology and um, cellular contact homology in, in uh, a way to be determined. Uh, but I think um, at least for this introductory part, it's probably good to go through it in more detail um, and not cut that um, just to make sure as many people are along for the ride as possible. Um, okay, so uh, this is kind of the stuff that I need from last time that, uh, that uh, we did. Um, okay, so our, our setup again is a, a contact manifold, which is a pair, an odd dimensional manifold, and a distribution, two n dimensional distribution. Um, and it's going to be convenient to choose a contact form for the discussion. Uh, contact form's not unique. Um, and then we had, uh, I used the note by L, a Legendrian submanifold. What that means is it's n-dimensional and it's, co -tan it's uh, tangent bundles in this distribution. And then at the very end, uh, I defined re vector fields given uh, for a particular contact form alpha. And so that was defined by these two equations. First of all, uh, when you stick it into this um, two form d alpha, uh, no matter what other vector you pair with it, it's zero. So automatically, um, that tells you that this vector field is going to be transverse to the contact distribution. And then here's like a normalizing condition. And um, so the main example uh, for these talks is the, is the one jet space, the cotangent bundle cross R. And uh, the contact form in question locally will be written this way, uh, dz minus y dx. Although really, this is supposed to be the canonical one form on the cotangent bundle. I'm just writing it in coordinates. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this example is that um, there are two projections. Uh, there's the complex projection where you project out the z coordinate, and the front projection where you project out all the other, all the y all the momentum, the y coordinates, to the. And uh, why why are these projections to consider? Uh, well, first of all, if you um, take a Legendrian L, which is sitting up here, and you draw its projection in either of these spaces, you can recover from the projections the original L, in this case, simply by integrating y dx to get the z coordinate, and in this case, by differentiating z with respect to the different xi to get the different yi coordinates. Um, this is useful for computational reasons. This is useful, uh, useful for um, analytic reasons to prove things are well-defined, uh, holomorphic curve theories. Um, and then, uh, in this case, the Reeb vector field is just, you can check, it's just d by dz. And, uh, and so, oh, I forgot to mention Reeb chords. These, these are the things we need to study. These are flow lines of the Reeb vector field starting and ending on the Legendrian. So here, the Reeb chords, which I'll denote by RC for Legendrian, you can see, since you're just flowing in the z direction, to start and end on L, it's exactly a double point of this immersed Lagr uh, exact Lagrangian projection. Or over here, you see it as a pair of points which have the same x-coordinate, this is the x-direction, and the same y-coordinate. That means the tangent uh, planes are the same. OK, so that's what uh, we... Um, all right, so having said that, I'm now we're ready to get to the definition of uh, Legendrian contact homology. Um, so, um, all right, so. Uh, it's actually better, to, although the contact homology is the invariant, really what we're going to be defining as Legendrian, uh, let's say, contact DGA. Um, so uh, let me just, uh, just at least to set some notation, say what I'm talking about with a DGA. So we have, uh, so R here is going to be um, uh, a coefficient ring. 
with Unity. Uh, script A is going to be a uh, freely generated um, associative algebra uh, with grading, um, which I'm going to denote by an absolute value. So you put in the, the generator there, and uh, with a unit. Um, script D, uh, uh, D is going to be uh, the, uh, what we denote by the differential. So this is degree minus one. Uh, algebra morphism uh, such that, sorry, not algebra morphism, it's degree minus one differential such that D squared equals zero, satisfying uh, Leibniz's rule. Um, I should mention that the grading here, uh, I'm usually just going to be sloppy and use grading in the way you normally think of it, but uh, oftentimes the grading uh, is, um, is cyclic valued and not necessarily Z valued. Uh, so sometimes situation geometry is such that um, the grading is not well defined. One very useful thing uh, about this EGA that we're going to study is that it's triangular. Um, and there might be other words for this. Uh, this is the one I learned. Um, that is, there exists some sort of thing, something called an, uh, called an action uh, on the generators. And I'll denote it by Z because it actually is related to the Z coordinate here. Uh, Z. Uh, such that um, uh, such that um, uh, z of any word in the algebra is less than z of uh, any word in the differential is less than z of the original uh, of the original element of the algebra. Actually, I guess you could say this is an action on the whole algebra if you want. Um, so if you want to think of it on an algebra, uh, an action on the whole algebra, uh, I guess you'd have to say something like uh, z of a, of a word is just going to be um, the action of a word is just the action of the individual pieces. Um, and then if you had some sort of something other than a monomial, uh, you could set it equal to the maximum. Uh, and z of 1 is 0. Um, OK. Uh, and so um, for us, uh, we're not going to get algebras that are isomorphic, but we're going to get algebras that are homotopy equivalent or quasi-isomorphic, or even more specifically, stable tame isomorphic. Uh, so let me just uh, give you a definition for that. So uh, we say that uh, this is uh, stable tame isomorphic um, uh, if there exists a sequence of stabilizations, which is basically um, you take a, an algebra and you add to it two generators, let's say E1 and E2. Um, where, uh, I don't know, I'll call it DE, where uh, DE of E1 is E2 and DE of E2 is 0. Uh, so you could, a sequence of stabilizations and, and their inverses. Or a uh, sequence of this, or also tame automorphisms. Um, so that's something of the form, um, let's say, f of x is either x if x is not a, and if it is a, you send it to something to a plus b, uh, where b is another element in the algebra such that um, uh, a does not divide b. So some monomial or sum of monomials. 
And you also, these have to be graded, so uh, um, everything here uh, graded automorphism. So the B is the same grading as A. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so this is the sort of equivalence that we're interested in. Um, okay, so how do we construct this DGA from our geometric input? Okay, so... Um, Yeah, maybe I should just, I'm going to, I guess I'm just going to define it really for our main example here, um, this, this one jet space. Um, but you could try to define it for a general Legendrian and a general contact manifold and then see how far you can get before something might go wrong. But it certainly will work for this uh, main example. So, uh, so let's fix a Legendrian in the one jet space of some... Uh, smooth manifold. Okay, and let's let um, A be generated uh, by uh, the Reeb chords of this Legendrian. Um, so, right, I mean, I should say, just to be safe, let's make this generic because it's possibly not going to be finally generated um, or which I want it to be. Um, okay. Um, so, so again, we have a correspondence between double points in action for these, for these generators and, sorry, double points in reap chords. Um, so uh, we're, we'll define the action to be um, the integral of this one form, which is, um, remember, uh, dz minus y dx. Um, along the Reeb chord, uh, which in this case is actually just going to be um, the integral. Okay, so we're looking at uh, um, dz from, let's say, p0 to p1. Actually, I'll do p1 to p0. So here's our Reeb chord. Let's say this is p0 and this is p1. So it's just the z-coordinate of P0, the z-coordinate of P0 minus the z-coordinate of P1. So this height right here is what I'm calling the action. Um, sorry? Oh, RC, yeah, the Reeb chords, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so we define uh, the grading as follows. Um, so, um, okay, so we, um, so choose some path, uh, um, let's say smooth, in your Legendrian, uh, where you start at P0 and you end at PI. Um, yeah, I guess these points, this is really the projection of the points in the front. Okay, so I have a, we have a top and a bottom for this reap chord. We have these two points, that, the start and end of the reap chord. And we're, so we're actually flowing from the end of the reap chord down to the start. Um, and uh, actually, you know what? Let's do it this way. We're going we're gonna to choose the path in the front projection. We could do it in any of the projections, but, uh, or in the genre itself. So let's, let me just draw, for example, uh, a two-dimensional front. So I have my two-dimensional front here, and I have, a, I have my Reeb chord. Yeah, let me, one more color. Um, I have my Reeb chord, which I denote, and, and it's two points, so here's uh, P0 and here's P1. Um, Um, and 
We need the path is transverse to the cusps. So here I have, um, I have this, uh, say, this cusp locus here, where my front projection is not smooth. And so I'm going to choose some path such that it may intersect, so that it intersects the cusp transversely. Okay. Um, now, uh, we'll also choose a little neighborhood downstairs here in the base. Um, choose a, a small u in um, x. Uh, so this x1, x2 here is x. Um, open. Um, small neighborhood u of, let's say, the x projection of these points, which is the same point, um, such that um, if you look at the front um, of L, it looks like a graph of some function over U. So that means uh, this part right here and this part right here I have two functions that define, defined over u, whose image is this uh, front projection. Now, these functions are not defined globally. If I, you know, I can't extend them past this orange cusp here. Um, so, so note that, um, if I, the, the fact that, that these are tangent here, So note that um, the derivative of f, I guess, 0 minus f1 at, at this point is 0 because uh, we have tangent planes. So the difference has a critical point. Um, so after maybe a C2 small perturbation, and actually, since I said this is generic, I don't even have to do this. But after C2 solves perturbation, we can assume that um, it's a non, uh, it's um, F0 minus F1 is Morse. So this critical point is non-degenerate. Uh, OK. So I'm still trying to talk about what the grading is, just about there. Uh-oh. Mm. Oh, now you know what it, what it is. I um, yeah, I didn't. I was too impatient. <laughs> so I think all the subsequent talks will have to start with a recollection of. <laughs> <laughs> the one jet space. Oh boy. All right. Well. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, so now we can get to this definition. Oh, that's not so good. So let's let the grading of A be um, the Morse index of um, this critical point. plus um, the number of down cusps, I'll say D, of alpha, minus the number of up cusps um, minus 1. So by down and up, I mean because we're, we're transversely intersecting, uh, you could project the tangent vector and it'll either have a d by dz z negative or positive d by dz uh, component when it intersects the cusp. Um, so, uh, all right. So now this number here, uh, obviously it depends, at least at first glance, it depends on the choice of gamma. And I'm not writing gamma in the grading. Um, and so this is where the cyclic 
aspect of the grading comes in. So this, this grading is well defined in Z mod, what I'll call ML, uh, where ML is the Maslow number uh, for this Legendrian defined by um, the co-cycle, the so-called Maslow cycle. Um, cycle. Uh, mu, mu, where basically mu is just equal to the, the number of down cusps minus the number of up cusps. Um, sorry, okay, so that's, that's mu for any loop. And uh, ML is the minimum of this thing, where here I'm looking at any loop in um, H1 of L. Um, so uh, this is this is like. Um, This is like the uh, unoriented rotation number that um, I guess you saw in the lecture on maybe Tuesday when you're talking about Legendrian knots, that you learned about Thurston Bennekin and the rotation number. It was an unoriented rotation number because it didn't really care about um, the direction of the tangent vector. And that was like a... So anyway, this is kind of generalizing this idea. Uh, it's called the Maslow class or... Um, and that's how it manifests itself in this in this uh, particular example, in this one in this front projection. Yes, thank you. So this is like worried about writing hard here. <laughs> Not really thinking about what I was writing. Yes, from the top to the bottom. So, so gamma will intersect the cusps. Um, okay, so number of times, right, what is the number of down cusps? Number of times uh, it crosses cusp in a downward direction versus number. So, okay, so let, let's see, like in this case, for example, um, in this case, so here's my A. So my grading of A is going to be, well, first of all, this is a, a maximum. So the, the Morse critical, the Morse index is two, because it's a maximum in two dimensions. Then I have one, two down cusps and one up cusp for this middle guy. And then I subtract another one. So I get two. And in this case, this is actually well-defined. Um, the Maslow number zero, and you can just see there's always going to be one more down cusp and up cusp. Yeah. What's what? Ah, okay. So, um, so that means that uh, this here is the graph of F1, and this is the graph of F0 locally. So um, locally, I can look, make, write the front as a graph. Okay. In one dimension. So, so the, so the, so basically, um, the cusp here is where this is not non-smooth. Okay, and it has a specific behavior. Kind of looks like, you know, this x cubed equals. Ooh. Which, which middle curve? The orange one? Okay, so that is the cusp. This is two dimensions, so it's a cusp circle. It's a, it's a, yeah, you, I'm, I'm trying to draw this in three dimensions, so we have a whole circle of cusp points. Um, and here, yellow is on this sphere, crossing this, this equatorial cusp three times. 
sorry, yeah. If that, so there's this other direction, dimension. Any more questions about the grading? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I was probably rushing through it. Okay, so basically, um, so what we want to do is we want to we say, okay, let's just... Um, so look at all loops on L that generically... Uh, well, generic loops on L so that they, they transversely intersect the cusp locus so that we can define a down and an up cusp number for any such loop. And look at this quantity, the number of down cusps minus up cusps for each such loop. Um, look at the minimal number and absolute value. Um, so it's exactly taking out the ambiguity of why I don't have to, why gamma A is not on the right hand side, left hand side of this equation anymore. But it also is the Maslow number. That is, if you kind of come from the point of view of symplectic geometry and Lagrangian Grassmannian, it's, it's the Lagrangian, it's the kind of the rotation number in the Lagrangian Grassmannian of this path, of this loop. Um, OK. All right, so that's the grading. So now, what else do we need? Um, actually, I lost track of where I am. Okay, grading. All right, differential. Okay, so um, so here I'm going to give you two different versions. So um, two different uh, points of view. So the first one will be uh, the easier case when uh, J1 of X is standard contact R3, and this is due to Chikhanov. And it's combinatorial. And the second one's more general. Um, any J1x and, to some extent, any contact M um, but there are problems both in, like deep problems that make the theory not work, and then technical problems where morally it should work, but legally it's still um, in some state of proven, being proved. Um, and this is using pseudo-holomorphic curves. Okay, so let's start with the Conoff one. Okay, so let's say, um, so how do we do this? Um, okay, um, so all right, so so given a Legendrian knot, um, we're going to draw the Lagrangian, the exact Lagrangian projection in the xy plane. Um, so let me try to draw a, a, an interesting enough example uh, where I can illustrate a few different things. Um, so now if you remember from last time, I actually have to be Part of the information is what's an overcrossing and what's an undercrossing here. Um, that's coming from the, L L Lagrange, the Legendrian. When I drew it in the front projection, I didn't really care. Uh, I, this doesn't really matter either, I guess. Okay. Um, and so now uh, we're also going to label quadrants, label corners um, as plus or minus. Oh, I, I guess we should label the double points. Okay, because these are our generators. So here's one. Uh, here's another. Uh, B2, B3, and B4. 
and I'm not going to label these, but I mean, they, they'd, they'd be part of the algebra. Okay, and then we're going to label the corners. Each um, double points corners. According to this convention here, uh, given by the orientation of the plane. So uh, these will be labeled positively, and these will be labeled negatively. So in this case, um, uh-oh, that's the wrong way. Positive, okay, negative, negative, okay, negative, there we go. So basically, say, when you go around, let's say, counterclockwise, are you going from upper sheet to lower sheet or from lower sheet to upper sheet to determine the sign? Um, Um, and again, I won't bother with these. Okay, and now uh, we're going to uh, keep it easy. We're going to keep the, co the ground ring to just be Z2, so we're not going to worry about more fancy coefficients, although this could be done. And finally, what you do is you say DA equals some word where here you count, you count the number of uh, polygons, immersed polygons, um, with the positive corner, so I said some word W, with a positive corner at A, and uh, negative corners at the W's. So this is your definition. So in this case, we have, for example, um, this pentagon here. Okay, so that means. Um, Oh, and this is, I should say, the, the way we read off the word is given by the boundary of the polygon. So this, in this case, we're reading off the word given by the orientation of the polygon. So it would be uh, B1, B2, B3, B4. Um, we also have, this counts as a polygon. Um, and since there's no word, we just, denote, we just put in the empty word, which is 1. That's an element in our algebra. And the polygon has to be immersed. It doesn't have to be embedded. So, for example, here's another one. Which is not embedded because of this overlap, but that's okay. Um, so that would have the word um, B3, B4. So something that wouldn't count um, would be, I'll just draw, I'll just draw some, something that's not immersed, for example, would be uh, you go along here and maybe you turn around and then you turn around again and then you continue like that. So uh, So something like that is not immersed because there's a, um, an interior uh, branch point to this disk somewhere here. And the, the fact is we can't count something like that because something with a branch point here is different than something with a branch point here. There's a whole one actually two-dimensional collection of these polygons based on where the branch point is. Um, so those are things we don't count. Uh, OK. So that's, that's, in a nutshell, uh, the definition of the differential. Um, now, the, this is an example of holomorphic curves, because you can imagine that I have, I'm basically mapping, say, a disk with five punctures into this polygon, into this pentagon, and a disk with three punctures into this shape, and a disk with one puncture here. So it is maps, 
you know, disks in C1 to these shapes in C1. And they, these are whole, represented by holomorphic maps. Um, uh, but, but you don't need to use holomorphic curves for this definition. It's purely combinatorial at this point. Um, and uh, so, right. So you can check that, um, first of all, d squared equals zero. And second, um, if, uh, if uh, L is Legendre and isotopic to uh, L prime, then um, uh, A of L uh, is stable, tame, isomorphic to A of L prime, D prime. In particular, um, the homology of A is, oops, is isomorphic to uh, the homology of A prime. Oops. So the homology is the invariant. Uh, it should be. I mean, I didn't draw enough for you to compute the grading, but the differential is degree minus one. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe I didn't say that. Um, I think I didn't say it. That's a product, yeah? Oh, well, in a differential graded algebra, um, I mean, it's a map, you know, the D of A is another element in the algebra A, so it'll be, could be a product of the generator. Huh. Um, is that clear? Probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. It, yes, it, once you've proved that the DEGA is triangular, uh, then, then, yeah, the, the act, basically you can only, the only thing that can be here are combinations of chords whose total actions is less than the action of this guy. So that would be finite, because there's a finite number of chords. So I couldn't have B1 with a zillion times. It's too much action. Yeah. That may be another proof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if you, yeah, if you could show that, that would be another proof. Yeah. Uh, polygons that are immersed without these arbitrarily high branch points. Yeah. Tame isomorphism. Two and three, yeah. Yes, so what does it correspond to? Ah, okay. Yeah, so I was going to put that as a homework, like with an example, but, <laughs> but since I, then I decided I didn't have time, so let me just add. Yeah, uh, basically, um, if you have something like this, where um, <sighs> this is the middle one. Ugh. Upper, middle, oh, and this should be. OK, so this is my longest chord. And here is one short chord, which has moved to here. And here's the other short chord. So I'm, first of all, I'm kind of canonically identifying these chords, because continuously this chord goes to this chord, this chord goes to that chord, and this chord goes to that chord. There's some kind of singular moment where A union, C union B is the same as A. The kind of the, the two chords are collinear. But barring that point, uh, then you can check that um, um, uh, it's the map A goes to A plus B C. That'll induce an automorphism from this DGA to that DGA. 
And in this case, this is a lot harder to write down. Um, so here we have a stabilization because we have two new chords, E1 and E2, with D of E1 equals E2. But it's not that simple. There's actually, it's, it's a lot of combinatorics, but you can actually show that it's this stabilization plus a number of tame automorphisms through a complicated kind of gluing mechanism. Um, So that, that's a, a result of Chikhanov in this original write-up. OK. Um, yeah, it's not a very good one. Uh, so OK, that's a good, a good, a good example to do. OK, so. Um, Let's take a very simple, I only drew a fragment of a Lagrangian, but let me draw an actual Lagrangian. So I'll, I'll, I'll have the front projection. So again, I'll start with my favorite one. And let's say we stabilize it, I, I guess. Something like that. No, that's not the one I want to do. I'll do that one. Okay, so what does that correspond to? Uh, in the, so here again, this is the front projection, and here is the Lagrangian projection. So th this is not a Legendrian isotopy. At least, um, if it is somehow Legendrian isotopic, it has to be done through a very complicated way, but since you learned about thurston Benekin number, you can see right away the thurston benekin here and thurston benekin number here don't agree, so these are not Legendre nice topic. Um, so, um, so what's going on here in the, in the Lagrangian projection? So here, here I have um, one reap chord, and here I have two. And um, <clears throat> here I have D of A is 1 plus 1, because I've got this polygon and that polygon. Here, I've got D of A is just 1, because this is a positive corner. And this is a positive corner, and we're not counting polygons with two positive corners. Um, so I just have D of A equals 1 and D of B equals 1. Um, and so here, uh, the DGA, um, the LCH, is equal to, well, it has one uh, generator in degree 1. And, uh, and one generator in degree zero. That's, the, that's A, and that's one. Remember, one is in our algebra, so it counts as a generator. It's a cycle. D of one is zero. And it's not an image of anything, because, by the way, we're doing Z2. We're counting in Z2, so one plus one is zero. Over here, we have the unfortunate fact that one is equal to zero in LCH. So that, in this case, this is an algebra, a completely trivial algebra where the, you, the zero element and the one identity element, multiplicative and add, additive identity elements have been identified. There's only one element in this algebra, not even a generator, so to speak. Um, so this, this is an example where uh, a stabilization kills, well, actually, this always happens, a stabilization kills the Legendrian contact homology. So the whole morphic curve invariant doesn't do anything anymore. So it can't it detect, you know, Thurston Bennett can, can it detect how many stabilizations there are. But if I have one or if I have seven, the Legendre contact homology is trivial for both of those. Can't see that. 
Um, oh, the grading. So I would use this picture for the grading because I only define it that way. But this is a maximum one down cusp. So one plus one minus zero minus one. And here you can do it with the kind of rotation number, if you had, if if you learned about mass, if you learned about the. I don't know if you learned just about the rotation number for the Legendrian or yeah, probably probably that's all. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So that's actually the other one is it's kind of a arguably nicer way to do it because it generalizes to all Lagrangians, all Legendrians. But essentially, what it is is you kind of instead of counting the down cusps and up cusps, you take this path and you. Look at the tangent lines, the tangent planes of the Lagrangian along this path. So, um, side here. So, gamma a gives a path. I'll call it gamma a in the Lagrangian Grassmannian. That's the space of unoriented Lagrangian n planes in R two n. In this case, n is one, so it's unoriented lines in R two. Now it's not a it's not a loop. It's still a path because I started with this unoriented one and I ended with that unoriented one. So you have to throw in a convention of how to close up all loops at critical points. But then you get, let's say, a loop closing it up. And then in this space, the Lagrangian Grassmannian, there's a natural co-cycle called the Maslow class. And you define a to be equal to the Maslow class applied to this. And the reason why you do this is because if uh, if you did, there's some kind of thing called the, you know the Riemann rock or a Tia Singer index theorem, which basically connects this sort of topological thing with the so-called. Analytic thing, which will come into the dimension of the moduli space, so it's a natural thing to study from from that point of view of the theorem. Anyway, that's going way, way far out there. Um, okay, so um, let me uh, give the holomorphic version now. Oh, great! This blackboard. Actually, while I'm Heavily wiping. If anyone has any questions, I'll turn that. Okay. All right. So uh, the pseudo holomorphic version. Okay, so uh, our setup is: I'm going to write it in a general way, even though it's really only proved、um, in certain cases. So we have a contact manifold, and so I think I mentioned this, but just again, I'll review it. If not, so we have something called the symplectization. Oh, maybe I'll answer this as a question. The symplectization.、Uh, what do I call it? Nothing.、Uh, M cross R T. Oh yeah, write this as a kernel of a one form because we want our Reeb chords to be determined.、Um, so our symplectic form will be d of e to the t alpha. This is called the symplectization,、uh, and you can check first of all that this is an exact. Uh, uh, sorry. Well, it's obviously exact.、Uh, You can check that.、Um, okay, so let's let、uh, lambda equal L cross R. So here we have lamp L is our Legendrian. You can check that this is an exact、uh, Lagrangian.、Um, and then、oh, we need an almost complex structure.
fix an almost complex structure, commonly denoted ACS, uh, J. So uh, what is that? That's an endomorphism of the tangent bundle of this uh, symplectic manifold, whose square is minus the identity. Such which is, which satisfies several conditions. First of all, you need J to be omega tame, or let's say omega, well, omega tame, uh, which is um, omega of JV. V is uh, greater than zero for all vector fields, non zero. So this is a uh, a very useful uh, property. You can't get by without this because um, you need this for Gromov compactness, which basically says that the area of a holomorphic curve can't be negative. Uh, area defined by a metric, which is defined in turn by omega and j. It's kind of this triality between symplectic, uh, symplectic matrices. Uh, metric preserving matrices, uh, orthogonal matrices. Um, okay, uh, now are some, for some other conditions that are more specific to this symplectization framework. This doesn't, you don't necessarily need this for other floor theories, you do need this one. Um, so first of all, we want J is RT invariant. That is, if I look at the almost complex structure at some point in the symplectization and I shift not the contact coordinate, M, but let's say just the cylindrical coordinate, the complex structure is doing the same thing. Um, next thing I need, J of the contact structure, J leaves the contact structure invariant. So what do I mean by this? This contact structure is in my contact manifold. J is on my symplectic manifold. I just pull it up. Uh, this is pulled back from the projection. Um, and then finally, we need uh, J to identify the Reeb vector field and this cylindrical direction. Again, I'm pulling the Reeb vector field back. So, um, so here is my DT direction, and I have my Reeb vector field, which is transverse to the contact structure. And I'm saying J leaves the contact structure invariant, and it takes this transverse Reeb direction to this cylindrical direction. OK. Um, one thing that's nice about this condition is that, um, well, OK, yeah. All right. Um, so let me try to schematically draw what a holomorphic curve looks like. So I have M. Here's my symplectization. Um, and let's say this is at plus infinity, and this is at... And this, this copy is at minus infinity. Although, of course, it'll be... Let's see. And, and remember, I'm drawing this kind of... Uh, kind of outwardly growing shape here because my symplectic form is growing with T. So I'm imagining that there's more symplectic volume up here, a slice of height one than down here. It's expressed that way. Okay, and so let's draw um, Legendrian like this, okay? I'm not going to draw the Lagrangian because I don't have enough dimensions. So here's Here's L sitting in these different slices. Okay, and we're going to um, fix... Um, <clears throat> right. So let's fix uh, Reeb chords of L, A, B1, through BK. Um, and define... So I'll need to write this over here. Um, no, I guess I need this. Okay, uh, let's do the disk version. Okay, let's let uh, DK sitting inside the complex plane, complex line, or whatever, uh, be the disk with K plus one 
marked points. I actually drew that at zero i, uh, zero i and minus one, um, because you can always do kind of a conformal reparameterization to set up the first three points there, and then you don't really have control over the rest of the points. Those determine the conformal structure of a disk with k plus one marked points. Um, so I could kind of, kind of imply, you know, kind of secretly in that picture, but uh, you don't have to do that yet. Okay. Um, and let's let this moduli space of A colon B1 through BK uh, be, um, okay, so we're going to look for maps from D, comma, D K plus 1, I guess, or K plus 1. K plus 1 boundary into um, this symplectic, the symplectization and the boundary goes to the, like this exact Lagrangian, such that, first of all, it's J-holomorphic, so that means J-D-U uh, composes, uh, commutes with, uh, is D-U uh, composed I, so I here is the standard complex structure on, on C. Um, and then, I'm going to write this a little haphazardly, but uh, basically, as I approach uh, this puncture, um, UZ approaches this Reeb chord cross plus infinity. Whereas, as I approach any other puncture, uh, this map approaches the other puncture cross minus infinity. So that's said, said pretty sloppily, so there's a kind of more precise way to say it, but let me just give you a picture. So um, here I have, for example, here's A, uh, uh, B1, and B2. And I'm going to draw the arrow to indicate the Reeb flow. Um, and what's going on here is uh, I'm looking for maps that might look like this. Now, the reason why I drew this arrow going the other way is because in some limit, this is basically cylindrical. So I have a, a d by dt direction going this way and a negative d by dt direction going that way. But to be j-holomorphic, I'd have to be going in the positive Reeb direction this way and the negative Reeb direction that way in order for this to be true. Uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, in order for this to be true. Yeah. Oh, if I were doing fancier coefficients than Z2, yeah. Yeah, so um, I would want, uh, so the question was, do I care about the homotopy class of the image of this thing? And, if I did do it with H2 coefficients, then I'd throw in that constraint. Yeah, and here there, here there are only punctures, but the thing is, is that this thing is uh, conformally equivalent to this thing. This domain, I, I have a biholomorphism from this disk to this region. And then it kind of makes more sense to think about how I could map to a chord in some limit. But really, you're supposed to think of this little circles here mapping to the chord. So it's kind of slowing down as you get here, or speeding up, <laughs> depends on your point of view. Um, OK, so it's this set. Now, actually, uh, I'm going to count these things. So this is going to be modulo. Um, an equivalence where um, the u map phi is tau u prime, where here, this is a, um, a biholomorphism on dk plus 1, and this is translation in the rt direction. So the first thing to note by this invariance statement 
If you could find some you like this and you post compose with a shift, that would be another holomorphic map because, because of this invariance. So we're going we're gonna to mod out that whole collection. And then um, this, this, is, this is only interesting if there's two, one, uh, zero, one, or, well, there's never zero, but one or two punctures. If there's three punctures, this is a trivial, uh, there's no, uh, <coughs> by homomorphism. Okay. Um, all right. Ah, right. So, um, so that, that's the general uh, onjali space that we're counting. Um, oh, but in our specific case, um, I'll put this as a remark. When uh, M is just the J is, is just the one jet space of some manifold, um, then uh, because uh, the projection from M cross R to T star X, where you project out R alpha, and here alpha is. Um, dz minus y dx, where you project out um, the Reeb vector field and the, and the, the t direction. Is, uh, what do I want to say? Well, uh, then this projection uh, naturally induces a complex structure on T star X because we're basically projecting out one um, complex direction. Uh, and so holomorphic curves up here uh, which induces uh, a bijection between this moduli space I just defined and holomorphic curves uh, in T star X with boundary on this Lagrangian immersion and corners at the double points. This Reeb chord has been projected to a point, projecting out the Reeb vector field direction. And this Reeb chord and this Reeb chord have also been projected to points. And they're points all in the same, uh, they're all double points. And so um, <laughs> these holomorphic curve count in T star X is exact, in the case where X, for example, is R1, and we're looking at the one jet space, and we're looking at uh, the one jet space, we're looking at R3 then this count is exactly the Chikhanov count, uh, except for I haven't said anything about the dimension yet, so there could be branch points or something. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, so I, I haven't said which count yet. Uh, so at, at first, all I'm, all I'm saying is that this, the projection of this, the curves in this moduli space become these polygons, but they may have interior branch points. So it's more polygons than we want for Chikhanov at first. So I have to reduce the moduli space. Uh, and I'm about to do this. So uh, there's a theorem uh, that in this case, and it's slightly more generally, um, uh, so for generic J, and L, um, when this manifold looks like cotangent bundle of X cross R, uh, this moduli space is, uh, a, is a compact, in the sense of Gromov, or Deline Mumford, I guess, uh, is a compact moduli is a manifold um, of dimension 
uh, a minus summation bi minus 1. And this is actually, this dimension's not yet defined. It's only cyclically defined. If you want to have it be well-defined, you'd have to throw in this group ring coefficients and study, study the homology class of the, of the, the image. Um, okay, so... So, um, so now we can get to this definition. So, so define the differential. So again, we, have, we already have the algebra. It's the reap chords. And we have the grading. It's this up and down count. And now I'm getting to the differential. So, Oh, uh, yeah, pre-compact, pre-compact. Yeah, there is secretly an M bar that's compact. There is a bubbling, and you have to throw it in if you want to compactify it. Uh, um, Right. Um, okay. That is true. Um, so, so you're right. Without, without fixing the energy, without, well, okay. Sorry, that's not quite, no. So, okay, so this is actually a nice enough scenario where we don't have these bubbles where you're worried about. We have... Um, we have a well-defined action, and so the energy of the curve is the difference of the actions. So um, I haven't defined this, but the energy of U is um, is this um, due to exactness. Due to exactness of um, this Lagrangian and of the symplectic manifold. Partial A, uh, yes, because this is positive by the tameness. So Uh, no, because um, the infinite number of terms would make this negative infinity, but it has to be positive. Uh, so this is by the tameness. And this is basically Stokes' theorem. Plus this nice fact of our setup. Um, so, all right, so, yeah, so we're going to get a finite sum here. Um, so uh, dA is um, summation. You sum over all the moduli space, which are zero, uh, and you count it. So, so far, this is just a Z2 count. And you put that coefficient in front of that word. And so then again, it's a theorem that um, d squared equals zero, and um, uh, the stable tame, uh, this is uh, well-defined up to stable tame isomorphism. So if I change the Legendrian by an isotopy, or if I change my almost complex structure, um, I don't... Uh, the, the algebraic invariant doesn't change. Okay. Um, so, um, maybe since people have asked, it's worth uh, just... Now, nah, okay, no, I'm, I really don't have time, so I'm going to skip the group. We'll just stay in Z2. Okay. 
Um, yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to just in five minutes just explain compactness, but Yanke has assured me that he will spend a whole lecture on this. <laughs> so uh, I won't feel bad that, but, but I think I have to say this part because it is like kind of the, it's like the bread and butter of anyone who's doing floor theory. How do you decide what are, what's the algebraic structure you want to extract from your compact, from your holomorphic curves that you're arising at? And in the case of a DGA, you know, it's why DGA? That's to make d squared equal zero. Because if you started with just a, uh, if you start with a chain complex, say you want a chain complex. Okay. So you have, and you want to show something like d squared w of x is zero. So you look at the one-dimensional moduli space w x, and you look at all the possible ways that it could break. So, for example, if it breaks here, if it kind of, you know, what's the what's the boundary of the boundary of this? Um, well, it might break something like this, which is good. That's something you could appreciate. That's something that you can incorporate algebraically into your chain complex. This is exactly a term in d squared w of x. This, this is, again, just this thing, notation that Somnath was using. It just means, what's my coefficient of x in this expression? What's my coefficient of x in this expression? Okay, and again, we're thinking z2, so it's 1 or 0. But if you break something like this, this can also happen. And you have to include all of these things. And basically, you could have something like this. You might have, topologically, there's no reason. Uh, you could have something like that. Um, this, well, maybe I won't bother drawing this part. Um, something like that. So here's W, X, W, X, W, X. And here are other possible things that you might include. Let's say Z. All right. Uh, well, let's see. I'm running out of letters. A, B. And here you don't even have a chord. You just have a smooth bubble. Uh, but um, luckily, something like this and something like this can't happen by exactness. So this is the moduli space with no positive punctures and a negative puncture at B. Stokes' theorem says the energy is negative. This is the moduli space with no positive punctures and no negative punctures. Stokes' theorem again says, well, that's got to be constant. We're not going to, it's not a real bubble. So this is allowed, okay? And for this reason, you have to have uh, dw is not only have the term y, which you would expect in a chain complex, but it has the term something like x plus times a, which makes you have to deal with a differential graded algebra. Um, okay. So, you know, so, so for any of these theories, you're always starting from this equation. Find mi such that this is true, and then interpret this algebraically. Of course, you have to prove this, and this is where compactness and gluing and all that come in. This is compactness. This is gluing. Actually, I'd say the way around. Sorry. This is gluing, and this is compactness. And you have to prove those things. But then once you have all that done, then you have to interpret it, and this is how you do it. Okay, that's about five minutes. Um, okay, uh, so I've got 10 and then plus five penalty time. So let's see, what can I do? 
Um, okay, let me just try to... Um, I really would like to get through the end of what I planned for the first lecture today, so, <laughs> so that I can be exactly one lecture behind. Um, so let me just mention some, some kind of applications. Uh, so successes and failures and question marks uh, of Legendrian contact homology. So um, we've already said that um, uh, Legendrian contact homology can show that um, oh, I forgot to say what an augmentation was. Crap. Okay. So, um, uh, although Somnath mentions at the very end of last night, but I should say it again. So, uh, so we define uh, an augmentation epsilon as a DGA morphism. So this is this is the ground ring, and this is the zero differential. And um, in uh, actually Sonnath's earlier uh, lecture, we was talking about a infinity algebra. Uh, you can check. Okay, make this a homework problem. Homework. Um, check that if you have, let's say. Um, a is a, cur is a curved infinity algebra, and if, uh, let's say, A prime, D prime is its dual uh, DGA, then, um, okay, and if Epsilon is an augmentation for this dual DGA. Then, um, the DGA, let's say, A prime Epsilon, D prime Epsilon. So coming from here, where D prime Epsilon is Uh, I'll have a lot of notation here, running out of time. Uh, is D prime conjugated by the augmentation? So if uh, then this DGA has a dual. A infinity, what is the thing? How do you say not curved? Uncurved? Flat, which is flat. So the augmentation is kind of a way to remove the curvedness of a DGA or the constant term, sorry, the curvedness of A infinity or the constant term of a DGA. And it, you know, M1 squared in the A infinity becomes D1 squared in the, uh, the DGA. Okay. Um, shoot, six minutes. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So. Um, so uh, let's start with successes of, DG, of, of LCH. Okay, probably the first one is due to Chikhanov, but um, there exists Legendrian knots um, with the same uh, T, B, R, and topological type, which are not Legendrian isotopic. Uh, and for this, you, you, you can use the Legendre contact homology to distinguish them. 
Uh, there's a kind of a folklore that uh, there's probably only finally many such. This is inside standard contact R3. Um, you can define TB and R. Remember, um, TB is the linking number of L and L plus epsilon DZ, the Reeve direction. I don't know if you I think you saw that definition. Um, and this is the kind of the, the um, Legendrian immersion class. This completely determines the Legendrian immersion, as, as was discussed yesterday. It's, um, although not calling it a rotation number, but... Um, so you can define TB and R in higher dimensions. You know, the Legendrian immersion class and this linking number. And there exists uh, infinite and for all, for all, for all dimensions, uh, there exist infinite families of Legendrian uh, submanifolds, uh, which are pairwise non-isotopic. Um, but have the same TB topology type and are not distinguished via Lagrangian immersion. So, so it's a very rich flavor. However, um, I don't have that example anymore. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I think I'll skip the cohort thing, but... Um, Oh yeah, maybe I should just mention, and then and there's also this statement that um, if L, if the DGA of L has an augmentation, um, then um, uh, then what? Then. Uh, the number of double points of, here L is sitting inside J1 of X. The Lagrangian projection of L is at least one half the sum of the Betty numbers of L. Okay. Uh, by the way, all, and all these, for all these examples, all of these have DGAs with augmentations because augmentations are the way to actually compute DGAs and see if they're the same or, you know, they're the way to kind of do anything algebraically with these DGAs. Otherwise, it's a hard question to see if two DGAs are the same or not. Um, but well, those are some successes. Um, but there are also some failures of, of the differential graded algebra. Notably, that example that was asked about a stabilization. Um, and so, um, one minute, 30 plus half, five minutes. Okay, I could do this. Okay. So, um, there's this definition that uh, introduced by Murphy in 2012 about a loose Legendrian. So, we say that a Legendrian L sitting inside um, some manifold where here 2n plus 1 is bigger than 3, is loose if um, there exists a Darboux chart. Actually, you need one for each component of L, but we're assuming L is connected, such that in the chart, L, the um, local front projection, So this is an arbitrary contact manifold, so I don't have a global front projection, but locally I have a... The Legendrian neighborhood theorem says I have... Uh, well, I, Darboux theorem says I have a, a, a front projection. Um, 
looks like exactly like what you would think of a stabilization, but in a higher dimension. So here is, let's say, x1. Here is uh, x2 through xn. Here's z. This is my front projection. And I look something like this. Uh, anything more? Yeah, okay, so I'm basically taking this stabilization that we saw in, in R3 and just crossing it by the remaining directions. And I need a little technical condition here. So I have to have, if this distance is 2b and this distance is 2a, then I need, um, and I, the undrawn coordinates in the chart so here we have x1, y1 less than or equal to 1, z is less than or equal to a, this is the z direction, square root of x2 through xn squared um, oops, is less than or equal to b, and I also, undrawn here are my, co put my other co momentum coordinates. This is less than or equal to C. I need this condition, A less than B, C. So supposing I have all this. So it looks pretty artificial. Um, but then uh, it turns out that, um, oh, where am I? Yeah. Uh, so this theorem due to, due to Murphy that um, any two loose Legendrian submanifolds, which are formally isotopic, so you can imagine, uh, so we talked about, so formal isotopy was talked about uh, last, uh, not my lecture, but, but yesterday, uh, but it's also, just, you could say, having the same R, R and topological type. Um, they're formally isotopic, then they are also Legendrian isotopic. Um, and in fact, loop is everywhere. Uh, even though there's all, this, all these examples, these infinite families of things which have, which are formally isotopic, they have the same R and TB and topological type, but they're all Legendrianly pairwise distinct. Loose Legendrians are everywhere. Um, are C infinity close to any Legendrian? <sighs> um, actually, loose Legendrian embeddings are C infinity close to any Legendrian immersion. You could say something like that. Uh, so they're quite common. Uh, so on the one hand, you have this very, you know, this infinite sets of uh, Legendrian classes. On the other hand, you have these guys that are, um, you know, uh, have no rigidity to them. And if you could, if you could just see, um, you can check that, um, all right, as a homework, check that, uh, uh, loose implies the Legendrian contact homology is trivial. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a chord right here. Where DA is 1. Um, so right, so... Um, Oh, and I, maybe I didn't mention this, this, this too, this also fails. So, um, result three also fails. So, um, so let me just end this uh, section with just a few, I'll just, yeah. Well, maybe I'll just state that, restate this. Um, open problem I was talking about in the first lecture. So on the one hand, you've got 
DGAs, which when equipped with augmentations, give you a lot of rigidity. On the other hand, you've got DGAs, which have this one little piece that not only kills the LCH invariant, but then makes there be complete flexible. There's no, there's no rigidity at all. And so the question is, um, how can you improve the holomorphic curve theory to kind of bridge this gap between Ls with augmentations and uh, loose Ls. Um, is, there, is there enough holomorphic curve theories? You know, so LCH here is zero. Um, is there enough holomorphic curves uh, to kind of capture all the rigidity that you might see in this unknown section? unknown area. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I kind of ran out of time to make the, anything precise about this open question. I had a bunch of open questions specifically, but I think I'll just end there with my first lecture. So, and then we'll start the second lecture uh, tomorrow. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yes. DA actually equals one in any coefficients. Yeah. So I have actually one. So regarding this thing, like loose line that it see uh, with Stevia, I think the whole algebra without not the algebra, the, al the the homology algebra. Yeah, the homology algebra. The DGA. Yeah, it's huge, and then I could change it. Yeah, but homology algebra is true. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank.